Good afternoon, Facebook. Skip Bayless coming to you live from West Los Angeles in Century City, about a mile from the Fox Studios, where tomorrow we will be back in business on Undisputed, 6.30 a.m. here. It's 9.30 Eastern till noon Eastern on Fox Sports 1. I'm about to spill my final thoughts on Cowboys Chargers, but first up, happy Thanksgiving to everyone out there. Happy Thanksgiving to my wife, Ernestine, who's standing here holding our quote-unquote daughter, our now one-year-and-one-month-old Maltese Hazel. She would like to say happy Thanksgiving to you. She's had some health issues, but she's starting to round back into form here. But she did, whoops, I got to get a hold of her. She did have to get shaved, so her hair is starting to grow back. She's starting to look like Hazel. Hi, Hazel. Hi. How are you? Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Hazel. Say hi. Say hi. Say hi to Facebook. Look. Look. Say hi. She's kind of distracted. She's getting ready to watch CBS, watch the Cowboys. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to Ernestine. And happy Thanksgiving to all those Dallas Cowboys getting ready to play football at Jerry World. Final thoughts. This is a death match, quote unquote between my Dallas Cowboys and a team that I liked a lot going into the football season, the former San Diego, now Los Angeles Chargers. I went way out on a limb in my preseason predictions and said, I thought the Chargers could steal the AFC West, and guess what, boys and girls? They still got a shot. The AFC West, what I thought was going to be the AFC best, has turned into the AFC worst. The best defense in the AFC worst, quote-unquote, is the Chargers defense. I loved it going into the year. Hellacious pass rush featuring Joey Bosa, who I campaigned for the Cowboys to pick fourth overall in the draft a couple of years ago, and they shocked me by taking Ezekiel Elliott, and I say, you got me. I sure can't argue with that pick. Obviously, Ezekiel Elliott is currently serving a six-game suspension, but be that as it may, Joey Bosa has been a monster, and he wanted to get drafted by Dallas, as he said on the conference call to the Cowboy media last week, and I figure he's going to be off to the races down Dak's backside and neck today, but I'm expecting, obviously, for Tyron Smith to be back in the lineup. I'm expecting, I don't know that for a fact, but that's what they are projecting. He did practice is he going to be a little limited once you got a groin issue? It's just tough to go side to side. So is he going to be Ty Smith, the most dominant left tackle, especially as a run blocker in pro football? I don't know, but I'm glad he's back just on presence alone. But the Chargers are still afloat. I always admire Philip Rivers. I know he can make the big mistake at the wrong time, but he is a gamer. He is a fighter. He is a trash talker, and I fear him today because he's gone up against Dallas twice in his career, and he's beaten them both times. I'll never forget that 2009 game at early Jerry World. And, boy, he just picked the Cowboys to pieces, as I fear he might do today. That Cowboy team turned around the next week. Do you remember this? Longtime Cowboy fans and went to New Orleans against the undefeated Saints in December and beat them. DeMarcus Ware suddenly went from disappearing to life and he was all over Drew Brees the whole game and they pulled off the biggest upset of that football season but New Orleans obviously went on to win the Super Bowl but I remember Philip Rivers having a whole lot of fun at what was then very new Jerry World in 2013 in San Diego he outplayed out sort of outshot Tony Romo that game and so I'm figuring he feels real good about going up against the Dallas Cowboys, and they feel real good about what they did to Nathan Peterman, who got thrown into the fire at Los Angeles last week after he had a pretty good finish to the game against New Orleans. He was sort of the quote-unquote gem of the draft, John Gruden's favorite quarterback, and the Chargers just ate him up and spat him out. And here they come feeling real, real, real good about themselves on defense, and Casey Hayward, Vanderbilt University, is one of the best cornerbacks in football, and he's going to be on and probably all over Des Bryant. So, yesterday on Unds- I'm sorry, yeah, yesterday on Undisputed, I'm saying we're off today, but we're on yesterday. 
I fought with myself all night long and I went ahead and I've dug myself in on this. Maybe I've dug myself a, a grave on this, but I've said from the start, it's Sean Lee or bust on defense for the Dallas Cowboys. So I've backed myself into that corner. And so yesterday, as much as I wanted to pick the Cowboys, who, who are still barely alive, barely afloat, and as much as I wanted to take them, I just don't know how they're going to really stop Phil, Phillip Rivers for four quarters. And I, I don't know how they're going to start, stop Melvin Gordon for four quarters because we've seen what's happened in four games without Sean Lee. Think about this. Four games without Sean Lee. They've played four really good first halves. Four really good first halves. They were ahead in three of the four, barely trailed Matt Ryan 10-7 to seven in the other one. They were ahead, obviously, last Sunday night, what was it, 9-7 to seven at halftime against those high-flying Fly Eagles, Fly Eagles. So three out of four, let's just do this. Four out of four times they've been right there, had good chances to go close the deal, and they got annihilated in the second halves of those four games by a combined score – you ready for this? Of 89 to 16. That's what they've been without Sean Lee for four games in the second halves. They have lost 89 to 16. So how can I how can I do this? I, I, I fought with myself. There's only one way they're gonna win today. There's one way. They have to force two turnovers, and Dak and company, the Dak attack, has to play clean. It's just as simple as that. If, if the final score is two to nothing and turnovers in favor of Dallas, Dallas will survive and advance and still have some life left. Can they force two turnovers? I don't know. And, and I'm still very upset about this. And I first guessed it, so I'm not being 2020 hindsight hypocrite. I've said all year they should have signed Darrell Rivas and or Antonio Cromartie. They, they needed veteran Hall of Fame type presence, especially in the secondary. After all the players they lost, and they're trying to fit in new young cogs in Rod Marinelli's scheme, and they think the scheme is the star, but you need some presence. It all revolves around the sun, so to speak, in the defense, the quarterback, the driving force, the leader, the signal caller, sort of their Tom Brady of the defense, Sean Lee. He's everything to that defense because he can cover, he can plug, and he can pass rush. He can blitz. He can do everything, and he's always knows for the ball. He's always in the right place at the right time. So it, it's him or bust. And if you take him out, they'll hang in for a half, maybe because the offense plays keep away in the first half. And then in the second half, they lose keep away games. It was 19 minutes to 11 minutes in the second half against the Eagles last Sunday night, and they gave up 180 yards rushing just in the second half alone. Do I still love this team? Do I still like its long-term chances if they could just sort of get through the night here? Yeah, I do. And I keep looking down the schedule, and I think if they could just win the quote-unquote death match today, think about this. Could they beat the Redskins? Sure they could. Could they win at the Giants? Yeah. Could, could they go win at the Raiders? As Z comes back, I may have the schedule out of sync. I don't have it right in front of me. Yes, they could. Could they win to beat Seattle? Who else am I forgetting? They got Seattle at home, and then they go to Philadelphia. Is it possible they could go to Philadelphia with a chance to win that game and be a wild card? Sure it is. Dak said last week, I, I kind of wanted him to say, we're going to run the table, as Aaron Rodgers said, but... Dak not quite in position to do that, even though Aaron Rodgers was 4-6 and six last year when he said it, but he's a little more proven, I guess, than Dak Prescott. Which brings me to Dak. I'm a big fan. You know it. But I can't defend what happened Sunday night. He had a bad game. I said it. I, I told you that right here on Facebook Live right after the game. It was his first bad game in 27 NFL starts. And remember, through 25 games, he was on an historic all-time great pace. Number one all-time in touchdown to turn turnover ratio. Think of that. Through 25 starts on an all-time pace of touchdowns generated, that'd be throwing and running, versus Turnovers lost, which would be interceptions and fumbles. All time, all time. 
Number one, Dak Prescott, through 25 games. Is that a small sample size? No. And I get outraged on Undisputed when Shannon Sharp and others say, oh, he finally got exposed. Baloney, he got exposed. The, the first the game in Atlanta, obviously, the Chaz Green game, my God, I mean, Adrian Claiborne, I didn't even know he was a Falcon. He wasn't even a starter for the Falcons, and he gets six sacks, and they get eight? Are you kidding? I thought Dak hung in and played pretty well, played valiantly in that game. But then Sunday night, he tried to do too much, and he just had a bad game. I, he, he got desperate. He threw 14 balls to Des Bryant. I'm sorry. I know a lot of you out there love Des Bryant. I love Des Bryant. Seriously. I, I mean, I've been the biggest – I can't hold my phone and cross my arms. I've been the biggest Des Bryant fan – going and it was a catch you, you know it was a catch and i know it was a catch in the playoff game at green bay but i don't know what's happened to him we did it with terrell owens yesterday on undisputed and eric dickerson i he's just a shell of himself a shadow of himself he's broken down he can't get get any separate he, he can't get any separation so every team comes in and puts their best cornerback on des and just says he's out and and dak who's a progressions guy. He, he plays the right way, as they say in basketball. And he just, against the blitzes, and Jim Schwartz was just throwing the kitchen sink blitzes at Dak Prescott, he, he just knows that, oh, my hot receiver is 88 because he's single covered. And he just throws it up for grabs. And finally, I thought it was a sign of life on Wednesday, Dak said, I shouldn't have done it. Especially on the third and sixth play at the 29, Eagles 29, when it was still seven to six Eagles in the second quarter, Dak just threw it up for grabs against the blitz. And, and what, what happens is that, that the, the corner just runs Dak's routes. I'm sorry, does his routes, just, just runs them. Like, like it, it feels like the corner is always the primary receiver. Just name them, starting with Janoris Jenkins. They just, they just mirror him because he's easy to mirror. And he doesn't run much of a route tree. There's nothing really creative or shocking or, you know, element of surprise to anything Dez is going to do because he got away with, for years with Tony Romo, just winning jump balls. Tony could get away because they did have a great wavelength. Dez was much healthier, much more spry, if you will. And Dez could just go up over people and do what we just saw Marvin Jones do between the double coverage. Again, the Vikings screwed it completely up because Terrence Newman was the 12th man on the field. So they actually had their two best corners by accident, Xavier Rhodes and Terrence Newman, covering Marvin Jones Jr. So they're both kind of looking at each other like, what are we doing here? You know, you got him or I got him. And Marvin Jones just goes up and snatches it right between them for a, a big touchdown that almost got Detroit back in the game. When do we see Dez do that? That used to be his calling card. You just throw it up to him, and he was such a luxury, such a security blanket, and now he's a liability. And if you throw him 14 balls in a game, and he's barely caught half the balls that have been thrown to him this year, it's, it's devastating. It's a loser. You're going to lose. And I said yesterday on Undisputed, I'd be happy if they started Bryce Butler. He's actually just as big as Dez, except he's an inch taller, and he's way faster than Dez. And it seems like every time the ball goes to Bryce Butler, something good happens. I don't get it. And, and he just – now Bryce can't get in, in the game enough because he's basically Dez's backup. They threw him two balls Sunday night. Of course, he caught both balls. It seems like every time he catches a ball, it's for a big play. And you can say, well, because he's got the ultimate element of surprise because they, they just don't – you know, they, they don't think much of Bryce Butler. Who do they throw it to on the fake punt at Atlanta? Bryce Butler who caught the ball, but he had pushed off. And so that was a big loss. But that was where Jason Garrett was saying, hey, we're desperate. We got to do something here because without Sean Lee, we can't really stop anybody or hold on. So the ball has to get spread around today. They have to find a way to get Cole Beasley back involved a little more. He, he is dramatically dropped from last year in large part because teams just finally said, we're going to take him away. We're going to commit two people to him every play in all those little underneath routes, all those little Wes Welker, Julian Edelman routes. We're just – we're going to take them away. Well, they try to take them away from Edelman. They used to try to take them away from Welker, and they really couldn't. So maybe you need to 
figure out with option routes how to get him the ball just a little bit more. Maybe Terrence Williams has to get involved more. Please involve Bryce Butler more. And every once in a while, even though Jason Witten can't separate from anybody, just throw it to him. Just, just, it, it, he just shields people with that big old body of his and those great hands. Just keep throwing. I'll, I'll take five yards to Jason Witten every play all day long. It's just it's a great ball control play. And could they please get Alfred Morris off faster? He always has a burst in the second half. We say, oh, there he is. But by then, it's a little too late. They got to establish the ground game. You can run on the Chargers. It's hard to throw against them because they're just hellacious. Leggett, and they come from everywhere at the pass rush. And Casey Hayward is really good. So it's, it's going to be a grind, but you get it, got to get back to Dak attack, control the football. And it's a lot of pressure on Dak today. I'll be the first to admit it after he had such a sensational start. See the Cowboys coming on the field. He had a bad game. He's got to bounce back. Now, Tony Romo is going to be sitting up in the booth, and he's Dak's one interception away from people chanting. See Tony just coming on TV here. Chanting, Romo, Romo, please come down out of the booth. I don't think that's going to happen. I think Dak is going to play very big and very well today. If the defense can just hang on and somebody can force something somewhere, just, just some somebody's got to get their hands on the ball and make something happen. I don't know if that could – I'm rooting for Dallas. I, I'm going to say this in conclusion. Dallas has a much better chance of winning this game than I thought they had against the Eagles. I give them a great chance. I just don't know if they can hang on. I picked it yesterday 30-28 to 28 Chargers just because I feel like they won't quite get home in the second half. But I dearly hope I'm wrong. I'm, I'm rooting like crazy for Dallas. And I will be right back, right back after this game to talk about it, win, lose, or draw, come hell or high water. Great movie, by the way. I still have a good feeling about this football team. I will leave it at that. I will see you after the game. Over and out.